Hey, Jamie, we've got a new sponsor. Oh, yeah. Is it Wacom? No, wait. Wacom. No, Wacom. No, it's Wacom. Oh. Pronounced Wa, like the Japanese word for harmony, and come for computer. The Wacom Cintiq 16 Creative Pen Display and accompanying Pro Pen 2 work in perfect harmony to give you the best in precision, control, and ergonomic comfort. For more information, head to Wacom.com. That's W-A-C-O-M dot com. Wacom. When people say that they can't find anyone diverse, we were like, that's ridiculous. There are millions of people of color on this planet, if not billions, and they're here. You're just not looking for them. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever, and today we're talking to Amélie Lamont. Amélie is a digital product designer, writer, and creator based in Brooklyn, New York. And in 2016, she was recognized by the White House as a changemaker at the United States of Women Summit. So we will definitely hear all about that. She's also co-created People of Craft, an online showcase and database of creatives of color and their work in all facets of the arts. And she's a board member of the New York chapter of the American Institute of Graphic Arts. So let's talk to Amelie. My name is Amélie Lamont. I am a digital designer based in Brooklyn, New York, as well as a writer. I do what I do because I think it's important for people who are younger, essentially the next generation, and also people of color to see that there are people who look like them doing anything that they want to do. It's about representation and equality and uplifting people. That is fantastic. And we are 110% behind everything that you're doing. Thank you. Um, So we're very excited to talk to you. But I want to go back to the beginning. I want to know more about your childhood, what kind of kid you were, what your family was like. My family is from Jamaica. I am a first generation American. And when I was a child, I was very nerdy, loved to read. My dad had the famous Encyclopedia Britannica on his shelves. Um, and I loved reading them as a child, which is, I know it sounds very strange, but that's what I was super into. When I was a kid, I used to go over to my dad's house often. My mom and dad were not together. And he taught me how to use computers. Um, He taught me how to make smoothies, which was just random, but also very delicious. I remember playing (laughs) solitaire with him. He was essentially a jack of all trades. He loved to sew. He just randomly made curtains on some days. And on other days, he would DJ in the city. (laughs) So I think I inherited a lot of that from my dad. And as a kid, I would make comics, I would paint, I would draw, I did all kinds of things. And I was also a huge nerd. Besides books, I loved anime and video games. And as I got older, by the time I got to high school, I had like a few things under my belt. Like, so winning poetry contests, writing contests, doing the cover for the yearbook, doing things like designing set plays. And when college time came around, so senior year of high school, I remember explicitly telling my mom that I wanted to go to school for illustration. And her response was, I did not come to America for you to be a starving artist. And my Uh response to that was, oh, wow. Hmm, I don't like that answer. But I suppose that is quite logical because you are an immigrant. So what do you want me to be? And her response was, you can be a business person a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer, which is like the common trope for all immigrant parents for what they want their children to be. So I ended up going to Drexel University and I double majored in business and engineering because she gave me four things. So I have to be an appropriate Jamaican child and do two out of four, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So double majored in two of them, um, business and engineering. And I was at the top of my class, but I hated it. I despised it. And at one point I went to the head of the program and I go, yeah, I, I can't do this anymore. And she goes, oh my gosh, why? You're, you're my top student. You're, you can go to Lockheed Martin and blah, blah, blah. And in my head, I'm like, I don't care. (laughs) I really don't. (laughs) I just want to make art and do that design stuff. I actually changed majors at Drexel, hated it because all they did was photography. And I was like, well, 
photography does mean drawing with light, but this is not what I meant when I said I wanted to do art. So then I switched to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Still really hated it. And I realized mm. later it was because I just despised Philadelphia being a native New Yorker. No offense to anyone who's from Philadelphia. Because coming from New York, in my brain, I'm like, oh, yeah, like everything's open 24-7. So I would leave my dorm at like 1 a.m. to go get food and everything's closed. And I'm like, what the? Why? <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> so then I applied to SBA. I was too scared to apply for illustration or design. So I copped out and I applied for photography and I got in. And I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) And I hated it because for the foundation year, at least when I was going at SVA for photography, all they have you do is walk around and shoot with a camera. And my hope was that my foundation year would be literally in a classroom drawing, learning about textures and shapes and tone, all of that. But that's not what the photography students got. So I ended up going to the head of the graphic design department and pleading with him, please, please, please let me in. And he's like, yeah, why did you do photography? I'm like, I don't know. I was scared because I suck. And he was like, no, you don't. And I was like, oh, my God, thank you. (laughs) Um, So I switched majors to graphic design. And then my mom got sick. I had um, a really bad breakup with my boyfriend at the time. And I just I could not focus. And I was like, "Okay, you know what? I'm going to take some time off from school. And also when my mom got sick, she was paying for school. She took out a bunch of Parent PLUS loans. And I kind of went to my mom and was like, you know what, mom, don't worry about it. I'll pay for school. Not knowing that for the one semester that I was at SVA, it was like $60,000. I ended up leaving thinking that I was going to go back later and then kind of started taking odd jobs here and there. Even in high school, I was designing, building websites for people, making art, writing. But it wasn't until I left SBA that I really started freelancing. So officially charging people for websites, doing photography work, actually teaching NYU students how to code, things like that. And then I eventually landed. Yeah. Wait, where did you learn coding? Did you pick that up on your own? Or was that part of? No, Ah, I I picked that up on my own. Self-taught. Yeah. um, It's very nerdy, again, because I'm a nerd and I embrace it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I learned how to code from Neopets, which I feel like, you know, it's funny because I, I was certain that that was my claim to fame. And then it turns out like every millennial and their mother has learned how to code from Neopets. So I'm very salty about that. (laughs) Because I thought that was like uniquely me, but it's not. I just wanted to put that out there. So learn how to code from Neopets and also GeoCities. The one thing I, I left out was that because I was a nerd and loved anime, I loved Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball Z, all of that stuff. I would make little uh, fan websites for those TV shows um, as a kid. And that's kind of where I learned how to do all of my coding that I do today. So this is fascinating because um, you seem like a total sponge just picking up useful information from all around you in your life. And I mean, obviously, you sort of hopped around education wise, but not like any of that information was lost. Would you describe like your freelance, this chapter of freelancery that you're describing? Was that your first solid step on your professional path? Yeah, I guess you could say it was my first solid. I did charge people for websites as when I was in high school and middle school, but it was weird because I'm like, I'm just doing this for fun. I don't, I mean, I guess you can pay me money for it, like whatever. It's one thing when you're living under your parents' roof and it's another when you are not. So Mm -hmm. I actually had to charge when I left SVA because I'm like, I won't be able to eat and eating is important for life. So Man, it is. And then tampons too. Tampons are very important. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So so you're you left SVA, so I'm assuming you have your own place and you're living with roommates in the city? Not quite. Okay. (laughs) This is super weird, but My mom actually wanted me to come back home. And my mom, being the very strict Caribbean parent that she is, um, would not let me drive because she said it was dangerous, even though I had my own license. Because we lived in New York, but then we moved to New Jersey. I left that out. Um, Okay. I was like, I am not going to come back to the boonies of New Jersey to be stuck there because you will not let me drive. So I will figure it out here in New York City. 
I actually ended up posting on Craigslist <laughs> saying... Love Craigslist. <laughs> back in the day, Craigslist was a lot better. Although it was kind of weird back then because when I... I had posted on Craigslist basically saying, hey, I can do all these awesome things. I can do web design. I can do graphic design. I can do photography, whatever you need. I can teach you how to code. I'm just looking for a place to live. And in addition to providing those services, I'll also cook and clean to earn my keep. So got a lot of creepy men. I was going to say, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. (laughs) My heart started racing. I'm like, oh, God, girl. (laughs) Be careful. Young Amelie was not as not as cautious as older Amelie currently is. Please, please tell me there's not another, there's not a terrible creepy man chapter I mean, coming there, up. There were, there were plenty. I actually did try to meet some of these individuals who did respond to the ad in person. Like one guy, um, because I'm tall, he was like, oh my gosh, you're so tall. You can sleep in my bed. And I was like, I, I, oh. Oh, oh no, no! I'm <laughs> like, good. well, that's very kind. That's, but... <laughs> that's absolutely not what I need. Um, another one told me that I could be a model, but I was too fat, and I was like, oh, wow, that—that that is just Jeez. that is so charming. It's so sweet. And then after continuing the search, because I was like, I'm obviously not going to live with these creepy dudes, I found an ad on Craigslist for. It had the title called Looking for a Gal Friday. And I was like, what the hell is a gal Friday? So I quick Google search and it's like a term from some movie before I was born. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I respond to it. And it turns out that the ad was put up by a minister here in New York City. Oh, all And right. a woman minister at that. Oh, oh, we're, get, we're getting into yeah. territory of, of safety yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> And she was the minister at Judson Memorial Church in New York City. And as a minister, they give you a parsonage. So she had this beautiful brownstone, not too far from SVA, actually, on 18th Street, um, that had a backyard, two floors. I had my own room, my own bathroom. And all I had to do was walk her dog and book her plane tickets. Damn, this story this turned is like out a- so much better than it started. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Yep. So I stayed there for about a year and change. Wow. Got back okay. on my feet, landed a job at Apple, Apple Retail, Fifth Avenue store, and that was interesting because I ended up meeting a bunch of people who have really impacted my life and who are still friends even today. And while I was at Apple, there was a friend who essentially said, "Hey." don't you do that web stuff? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, why don't you just like do that as a business? And I was like, no way. No one's going to hire me to like do that because I'm in my brain, I'm coming from the days of AOL and like GeoCities and Angel Fire. And I'm like, do you see what those look like? No one's going to, no one's going to hire me full time to do that. So I kind of ignored it. Eventually landed at a company called Squarespace, which everyone knows about because of my article (laughs) with them. Right. And how long were you at Squarespace? I started at Squarespace in 2012, like two and a half years, um, because I started there part time and then I moved up to full time. And then obviously, as everyone knows, I got fired in 2014. And then after I got fired from Squarespace, I was at my very, very lowest point. And it's funny because even while I was at Squarespace, I had tried reaching out to the designers there like, hey, like, how did you get to do this full time? So there were a lot of conversations with some of the people there, but some of it was a little patronizing, like, oh, like, you got to go to school. And I was like, well, I (laughs) I don't, I don't have that money. So I also have this philosophy that we live in this, this society and this idea complex where we believe that if we want to learn something new, we absolutely must go to school. And I completely disagree with that. When I got fired, I was like, well, I've already been designing websites for people and I've already been doing graphic design. There has to be a way in which I can make this work for me. So I ended up going to, I would say the August after I got fired, I ended up going to WeWork summer camp. And I met this random woman there who was just like a ball of energy. She's like, oh my God, I love you. And I'm like, I, I don't know you like that, but if you want to love me, you can do that. That's I it's, accept that, I suppose. It's true. I am lovable, so I can understand where you're coming yeah. from. I was like, I don't I don't 
I've never had anyone run up to me and tell me that they love me. That's very <laughs> odd, but sure. Thank you. She actually ended up introducing me to Startup Institute here in New York City. And with my connections at Startup Institute, I ended up landing my first freelance job as a UX designer, air quotes, because I was like, what the heck's a UX designer? And when I landed the role, I landed it because when I had talked to the CEO and the team, I explicitly spoke about not design, but I talked about everything from a business perspective. So what my work can do to help your business. This is how much money you're making. This is how much money you're losing. This is how we're going to cut those losses. And this how this is how we're going to increase your profits. Oh, and um, that is the universal language. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I think there was like a little bit of tension, like, oh, a designer, like she's just going to make everything pretty. And I was like, no, no, no. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to fix what's broken and I'm going to streamline it so that exactly. it saves you a lot of money and makes you a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. So then that transitioned from a freelance thing into full time. And after, I want to say, because I started there in March of 2015, in September of 2015, we raised our Series A. And a large part of that was because of the design work that I had contributed, um, including nice. a rebrand and uh, like redesigning the funnel and the flow. And then I actually released my article in 2016 about Squarespace. Can we just give our listeners a brief overview of that article in case they haven't read it so they can go find it on their own? Sure. So the article is called Not a Black Chair, and it details my experiences at Squarespace, explicitly dealing with a relationship that I had with a coworker, as well as racism and sexism in the workplace. It's explicitly titled Not a Black Chair because at one point in my tenure at Squarespace, my direct manager told me that she skipped me in a meeting because I was so black I blended into the chair. Which, as I think back on it, is kind of hilarious because my skin is brown, obviously, (laughs) um, and the chair was black. And I tried to give her an out and I compared my wrist to the chair and I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) My skin's brown and the chair's black. And she was like, no, 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 it's the same color. And I'm like, all right, well... (laughs) You just dug your own grave. I don't even know what to say to you. You just, I I literally, you know how like when you pass go and Monopoly, I just gave you $200 and you smacked it out of my hand. But I, Mm -hmm. I wrote that article in 2016 detailing everything. And it's funny because a lot of other black and brown women from Squarespace started coming out of the woodworks talking about their racist experiences. Oh, interesting. Um, Yeah, of of course. Mm -hmm. When somebody has the guts to speak up, it creates an opening. So after that, I ended up leaving Venue Book and shortly after started working at the New York Times. At the New York Times, things were good, but I started dealing with an illness that I've been dealing with for many, many years that I haven't quite addressed publicly or even to myself. So I took some time off, came back, decided that it was time to leave. And then I started at a agency here in New York City called ThoughtBot. And then because I didn't properly take care of my illness in the way that I should have, it came back to bite me in the butt at the beginning of, I'm going to say February of last year. Um, So I went on medical leave again. And then I'm actually on medical leave right now because I've kind of had this realization where, huh, if I am not taking care of my health, then I can't do any of the things that I say that I want to do for black and brown people, for society, for people who need it most, for anyone, but more importantly, myself. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. That's that's actually a really ad- important acknowledgement to yourself and an important thing, I think, for us to talk about. I don't want you to expose anything about your health condition that you don't feel comfortable sharing. But mm-hmm. in terms of getting to this realization that you are not an endless resource of energy, I mean, I think Jamie and I can both relate to operating from a deficit and how (laughs) depleting that is, and how that super duper ends up manifesting in physical illness. And that doesn't serve anybody, definitely not ourselves, but certainly not your mission and your goals. But like, what kind of internal place did you have to get to to make that realization for yourself and to start to carve out some time and permission for self care? I don't want to reveal too much because I'm actually I kind of came to the realization I want to say last week that I'm going to start addressing this publicly in a series. But what I can reveal is that 
last year I was traveling a lot. I got invited to speak at a lot of conferences, do a lot of events. I was also an Adobe insider. And I think there was a part of me that was like, okay, you know what? Anything that comes my way, I'm just going to say yes to. Just yes, 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 yes. Even though I had already been on medical leave earlier that year, I think Mm. there was a part of me that even though I was on that leave and then I came back, my brain, that lizard brain kind of like snuck out and said, you know what, maybe there was nothing wrong with you to begin with at all. Mm. Maybe you're absolutely fine. You should just keep pushing forward. So I kept pushing. I want to say in starting in August of last year, I was literally traveling almost every week (laughs) all the way until the beginning of November, which took a Uh, toll. Yeah. The best way to describe it is that I just, I broke, I had a breakdown. I was like, I can't do this. This is not right. I'm starting to get sick again and I need to address this. And if Mm -hmm. I go on medical leave again, I need to address this in a way that is appropriate so that this does not keep hindering me. Because if I look at the timeline, I went on my medical leave at the New York Times. Then I went on my medical leave at the beginning of last year. And before last year ended, I started a medical leave again, which means that the medical leaves are getting closer and closer together, Mm -hmm. which means that if I don't address this, there could be a point at which I could never work again. And Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I don't think anyone wants that. So I need to take care of myself. Yeah. I mean, that's such a hard decision to make because it means also probably canceling some things you've committed to. (laughs) I mean, just the feeling of like disappointing people who are counting on you. Mm -hmm. But I just I feel I feel this the struggle of this. (laughs) And I'm Mm -hmm. wishing for your well being, obviously, sending you healthy vibes. And yes, you do have to take care of yourself. You're the Mm -hmm. and you're the only one who's going to do that. Like nobody's going to step in and Yeah, nobody's going to advocate for you and be like, you know what, you look really tired, or it doesn't seem like you're feeling very well. Why don't you take some time off? Like, nobody's going to do that. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So when you say medical leave, you're referring to medical leave from ThoughtBot at this point? Yes, that's correct. Even though you're taking time off, can you still help us wrap our heads around what you're doing as a consultant and product designer for ThoughtBot? Yeah. Um, So at ThoughtBot, essentially what I do there is ThoughtBot's an agency, just for clarification. It's a product development agency. So what we do is we bring clients on board and we help them with whatever they need. So specifically, whether it's product design, which is developing a product or figuring out how to clean up the UX of that product, or maybe it's front end development or it's back end development. That's kind of what we focus on. And our core languages tend to be Ruby on Rails, as well as SAS. At ThoughtBot, a lot of the designers know, actually all of the designers know how to code. So that's kind of the the interesting quirk about ThoughtBot. And separately from that, you've taken it upon yourself. You've initiated many important projects. I want to call out some of them because I think they're awesome. Thank you. Well, Good for POC, as I understand, was a database of tech companies that had really good inclusion policies. That's correct. But I think that you shut that down or that's not still going. Good for POC is interesting because you know how every now and then you get an idea for a project that you really want to work on that you think is going to have immense value to the world. Mm -hmm. And then you put it into the world. And then you have a moment where you realize, huh, is this something that I want to do for the rest of my life? (laughs) Right. (laughs) I've created this thing that needs now somebody to nurture it and care for it and maintain it and and follow up and Mm -hmm. answer all the emails. (laughs) Yep. It's essentially a baby. Mm-hmm. And now I want to give my baby up for adoption and I feel horrible. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what it's like. Um, and I, I would say that's what it was like for Good for POC because all three of us as co-founders, myself, Kat Small, Jackie Alcini, we have all had horrible experiences in tech. And we were like, well, let's create this database that can help other people of color in the tech industry find somewhere safe and inclusive. But then we started realizing that there were barriers, if you will. So, for example, we want to create this database, but then we realized that there were people filling out the form who were CEOs saying, this company is great to work for. And it's like, well, you're the CEO, so of course you think it's good to work for. So that's, that's clearly biased. Or, for example, we would have people who 
would beg us to add them to the site, which completely goes against the ethos of this being good for people of color. The other thing that we also saw is that we incorporated incorporated ourselves as a business. And it's like, if we're incorporated, how do we make money while also serving people of color? Because capitalism at its core exists in such a way where, at least in the United States, people of color are often harmed by it in some way or another. They're exploited. So how can we take money from the very companies that are exploiting people of color? That goes against our mission. But we Ah. also have to pay taxes. Oh, I see. It gets really (laughs) complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then also, because of the way we created Good for POC, there was a certain sense of trust from people of color towards us. So if we are taking that money from those corporations, and then all of a sudden, one of those corporations pops up on the site, from a person of color's perspective, they're like, well, how can I trust that these reviews Mm -hmm. are okay because you're getting money from these corporations. It was a very difficult ethical dilemma. So we were like, "Mm -mm, I think we should step back from this. And, you know, it's so hard to get money for these kinds of things in in the form of donations or Mm -hmm. grants or, you know, uh, some sort of supportive organization that's kind of not directly tied to profiting off of it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So these things can just, you know, become such a beast to manage and figure out how to just make enough money to keep them going. Exactly. Um, But I mean, they are good for the community. So you're like, you're torn because you're like, but it's really important. But how are we going to do it? Exactly. Yeah. But let's talk about people of craft, because that is rad. So people of craft is interesting because Timothy Goodman, uh, an illustrator, if you don't know of him, and I are pretty good friends. And one day we were at a bar and we were like, man, we get invited to speak at a lot of conferences. What's your experience? And he was like, oh, like I always ask them to not invite me if there's only white people speaking. And I'm like, you're a good one. That's that's why I'm <laughs> friends with you. This is why we're friends. Um, and then I told him, yeah, like I actually have rules on my website, essentially saying that I don't speak at conferences that aren't diverse, that do not have a code of conduct, et cetera. And sometimes these conference organizers will reach out anyway and ask us to speak. And we often have to reply back and say, mm, actually, you haven't really, you don't fit the parameters that I've set up for myself in terms of my willingness to speak at your in your space. So I'm going to decline that. Do you frequently get people who reach out to you because they're like, but you're going to make it diverse. You're the, <laughs> you're the one who's going to make our panel diverse. And you're like, mm, you need to try a little bit harder than that. I ha- it's interesting because people, when they see me talk online, they get scared of me, <laughs> which is a trope because, you know, angry black woman. Right. But also, I'm very direct online and very straightforward. (laughs) So what has happened is I used to get that in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, because people understand what my voice is online and because they're also making assumptions about my behavior based on my skin color and me being a woman, when they see that page on my website, they're like, oh, wow, she's not messing around. Yeah. Well, let me just go in the other direction because I know I'm about to mess some shit up and I'm not trying to make her angry. So (laughs) that's... (laughs) <laughs> that's what? kind of how it goes for me now. Like I even had someone message me the other day who was saying, we want you to speak at our conference. And I ended up declining because I'm on medical leave, but they actually took all the bullet points from that page. And they were like, we saw that you required this, this, and this to speak at our conference and we will give you all of it. And here's proof that we have a code of conduct. And I was like, oh my God, you listened. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah. <laughs> People pay attention now, which is good. Which is awesome. And I appreciate that you've done that. And I might take a cue from that myself. (laughs) Um, But People of Craft is a database of people of color who are engaged in creative work and the design process. And it is tremendous. So I, I brought that story up just to say that we created it because we were like, when people say that they can't find anyone diverse, we were like, that's ridiculous. There are millions of people of color on this planet, if not billions, and they're here. You're just not looking for them. So let us create a database for you. And not just people of color who want to speak, but people of color from all backgrounds of all different levels of craft. And the biggest 
reason as to why we created it is because obviously I identify as a woman of color, as a person of color. And oftentimes than not, people think that me being black, that's like all I have to live for. Like you're a black woman, black, 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 blackity black. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. I'm a black woman and I'm happy to be this individual who I am as manifested in this world, but that's not all I am. I have other things that I'm good at and other things that I like to do. And you shouldn't make assumptions about me based on what I look like or what you think I should be doing. So we explicitly named it people of craft because we wanted to say, yes, these are people of color, but also they have the skills that you need because People often say, well, we want to be diverse, but we don't want to lower the bar. There is no bar being lowered. These people Mm -hmm. have the skills. You're just not looking for them. Here they are. That's insulting. (laughs) It's incredibly insulting. Well, I appreciate it, too, because for those people who don't know where to look, they no longer have that excuse. Yeah, I wish that there was something like that for other industries, because I feel like there are excuses floating around in every (laughs) industry why they can't find people of color to hire. And they're like, well, we can't find any. And you're just like, they're there. You're just not looking hard enough. And it really is about putting in the effort. And so, you know, that's something we've been doing a lot over on Design Milk in the past couple of years is like, really finding good people from yeah, everywhere. Exactly. Um, and, you know, it isn't easy. Sometimes you have to do some digging and networking, but mm-hmm. they're there. You just have to put in the effort. Exactly. I wanted to ask you, Are did you go back to school? I did. So the going back to school thing is interesting. When I was at Squarespace, I was in such so much despair about being customer care because I really wanted to be in design, but no one could tell me how to get into the design department there. So I actually ended up going back to FIT because, or going to FIT because I figured, well, this is not the degree I want, but maybe if I get a degree in advertising, maybe then they'll recognize me. (laughs) Went to FIT, started a degree in advertising communications and hated it. Um, That seems to be a trend with me in school for some (laughs) reason. I tend to not even dislike. It's just absolute hatred. It Um, sounds like it. Yeah, but but you keep going back for more. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) I hated it because by that point, I've been techie my whole life. So they made you take classes like Microsoft Word or how to create a spreadsheet. Oh, geez. Or how to make a Microsoft document. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to (laughs) scream. It was horrible. And then at one point I was like, look, can I just skip these classes? I'll, I'll even take a test. I'll whip up whatever you need me to whip up. I just do not need to be in, in these classes. And they were like, no, you have to take them. I ended up leaving and started school at SUNY Empire, which is all online and remote. And Mm -hmm. I get a discount because New York resident. And what's nice about that is they take into account your life experience. So I actually have a counselor mentor type person at SUNY Empire. And we sat down and we went through all of my life experience. I put together some essays for my life experience, submitted it to a board for review, and then I got credits for it. Awesome. Because yeah. you have been out there learning. You've been learning yeah. so much you could teach it yeah. and, t- and definitely <laughs> test out of those classes. So <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So I'm wrapping up two classes. My last two classes are going to be in the summer and then I get my bachelor's degree and then I'm done. And is it in cultural studies or? It's in cultural studies. Yeah. Okay. Thinking about all of this life experience and all of the different schools and classes you've taken and and websites you've developed, are there things that you've learned that you've taken into your creative process that have really helped you kind of get from A to B more quickly? I would say the biggest thing that I've learned in terms of all the hopping around I've done and all of the things I've had to learn by being scrappy is that from a design perspective, people who you work with don't really want to talk about design. They want to talk about results. And what I've noticed is that a lot of designers focus heavily on aesthetics. I think aesthetics are important, but that's something that I've found myself actually pulling back from 
a lot more in recent years, mainly because I very strongly believe that design is problem solving. And I've had a lot of problems that I've had to solve in my life. And there are many ways in which to solve a problem. So I think about how can I bring forward a solution, whether it's the company that I'm working for or the client that I'm working for, that is not just one track mind, but different possibilities that maybe even other designers who haven't had the same experience I have had might think of. There was one client that I worked with who was trying to build a website for essentially a database for diversity and inclusion for corporations. And when I was working with her, I was like, yeah, so one option is like, we're going to do a design sprint. And we ended up doing a design sprint. But one of my coworkers was like, yeah, like, have you, have you looked at like these companies and corporations? And he was like very by the book and it was great. And I was like, yeah, but also I'm from the streets. So like, what are some street solutions as well? (laughs) Because it's not just about something that you've read in a textbook or something that you've learned on the job. There are other ways to solve solutions other than just than like what you've done before. Like, how can you think outside the box? Mm -hmm. That's exactly the argument for diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. I I have a personal question for you is, and I'm wondering if you have found yourself applying your problem solving framework to your health challenges. (laughs) Yes, I have. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) I laugh because these past few weeks, I've been having some more challenges with my health in terms of insurance and medical billing companies. Mm. And I was so frustrated. And I was like, Oh, my God, like, you know, running around with a chicken, like a chicken with her head cut off. And then I was like, wait, wait, wait a second. I'm a designer. (laughs) You know what? I'm gonna make a list. I'm gonna create a a user journey. (laughs) I'm going to create different like milestones. I'm going to write down what I want, what I expect, what the objectives and the outcomes are. Wow. I'm very logical. And then after I did that, I was like, Oh my God, I feel so much better. Now, now I know how to resolve this. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Because you can apply your process to any, that's the thing about design thinking. You can apply Mm -hmm. that process to any challenge. Any challenge. It's great. When the cords are all tangled up, you feel like you have a method for, you know, untangling them, even if the answers aren't all revealed to you when you, you know, in a timely manner, Mm -hmm. you still have a process you can apply. I have found that I mean, I'm just relating to you a bit. I've also had some health mysteries that I've had to be really proactive about and Mm -hmm. solve on my own. You feel a little bit like a medical sleuth. (laughs) You Um, do. (laughs) (laughs) and it's really frustrating because you also see all the especially with the insurance all the places where the system is just not working or it's definitely not set up to service the people it's supposed to be helping oh doesn't it drive you batty it drives you insane i for me i was thinking when i was going through that little rough patch a few weeks ago i was thinking wow if you are trying to get people healthy I think that's a lie because you're like literally making me insane. This is crazy making like all of this back and forth. Oh, and the roadblocks are there not to get you healthy. They are there to make it so difficult that you don't get your claim. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Would you describe yourself as a linear or non-linear thinker? Or are you a little bit both? Are you equally in your right brain and your left brain? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think my natural tendency is to be all over the place. (laughs) But (laughs) usually when I'm having a moment where I'm panicking about something, I'm like, oh, my God, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I'm like, girl, can you just please take a step back and just like write it down? And then when I like organize everything in a linear fashion, I'm like, oh, okay. But I, I have to have like a little bit of time to like just be like in 20 different places at once. Yes, you have to zoom out and get the big picture. And frequently, the big picture is a bunch of information that you don't know how to sort until you get into the linear part of it. I totally relate to that. I feel like I feel like you and I could solve a lot of problems together. Yeah, we should. We should start our own company. Oh, my God. (laughs) I would love to. And also, I'm terrified. (laughs) 
Hey, what about me? Yeah, no, all of us. <laughs> We're all going to start a company. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not as good at solving problems. <laughs> I can teach you. You can learn. <laughs> And then we'll be like the three musketeers, but like for problem solving. Yes. <laughs> I'm ready. I love I've it. Already, I've already like filed for a C Corp. I'm ready. Let's go. Oh, my God. Okay. You're the CEO. I'll be the chief evidence collector. <laughs> I, I like research. marketing. Okay. <laughs> you're on medical leave right now. And I, mm-hmm. we know you're in school. You're doing mm-hmm. a lot of things. And you also get a lot of invitations to speak, and you mm-hmm. initiate a lot of your own projects. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you have set up for yourself, you know, like you have the rules of engagement on your website. Do you have mm-hmm. personal criteria rules for yourself to help you decide which projects to take on? Yeah, um, I would say that I've only recently started making those rules um, with this current medical leave. Because like I said, I was just saying yes to everything because I was like, I can't let anyone down. Everyone's relying on me. I must say yes. And then I realized um, I'm one human being. (laughs) I can't do everything. And you know what? That's okay. And also, I don't want to do everything. So this is going to sound like super woo woo and I apologize in advance for anyone who's like oh, I hate that woo woo shit it's kind of like a gut feeling like does this feel right is this what I need at this point in time in my life and also I also ask the question um how is this serving me mm-hmm. because sometimes we take a, on a lot of things just because we're like oh it'll give us more visibility and if I have more visibility then I can do this for people and I can do that for people and I can help society and I can help my communities and blah 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 but it's really important to take a step back and think about, is this serving me in any way, shape or form? So a really great example I'll give is I got invited to speak at a conference in South Africa. And I got invited to speak, I wanna say closer to the end of last year. And I said, yes, cause I was like, oh, South Africa, I've never been, this would be cool. Started thinking about like what my talk topic would be. And I also said yes to it because I'm thinking, you know, my medical leave will be over by then. Surprise, it's not. Um, mm. That conference happened a week and a half ago or so. And but earlier in the year of this year, I was like, yeah, yeah, this will be fine. This will be fine. And as the date grew closer, I really started to have to ask myself, with all the medical things that are happening to me right now, does it make sense for me to hop on a plane and not like a short plane ride, a very long plane ride to another continent, be around lots and lots and lots of people asking me questions, giving this talk, be in a place where I don't have access to the medical care that I currently need, um, and then do that very, very long flight all the way back. And the answer was no, Mm. because I need to take care of myself. So being on this medical leave, it has forced me to create a new set of personal rules around what I will say yes and no to. And right now it's mostly just saying no to everything because I've said yes to a lot of people and a lot of people have had access to my time. And right now I just need to focus on myself. Yes. I wish you power and courage in doing that because you're no good to anyone if you're, if you break down. So exactly. But it's hard. (laughs) Our society just makes us feel like we should always be working. Mm -hmm. And like, if you're just sitting at home, you're not Mm -hmm. doing anything, which (laughs) is not true either. (laughs) Because your brain's always working. So (laughs) yeah, that's frustrating. Well, and also, we're all self employed here. And that's our livelihood. So like the luxury to say no to something isn't really a luxury because you are cutting into your your livelihood, your exactly. economic livelihood by saying no. The little voice in the back of your head is always like, but, you know, you, you could have said yes to that and you would be, you know, <laughs> getting a paycheck in a couple months. And, and But then I'm like there with my daughter and she's like, you know, playing. And I'm like, you know, this mm. is really where I should be right now mm-hmm. in my life, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I want to talk about the the fact that you were recognized in 2016 by the White House as a yeah. change maker at the yeah. United States of Women Summit. That is so cool. What yeah, was that like? 
It was super interesting. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I'm a very direct person online, but I'm also very direct in person as well. And I found out that there was a table for Michelle Obama and there was like secret service all around it, but I just pretended that it was my table. So I just sat down there and then they told me to move. But, you know, I thought that was a pretty boss move. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I, just, <laughs> I was just going to wait for her and they were like, no, bitch. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But it was it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of really amazing and powerful women there. I think when something like that happens, you have a little bit of, or not a little bit of, a lot of imposter syndrome. Because How could I got you there and not? I was like, what yeah. am I doing here? I, did you did you pick the right person? Like, why, why, why am I even here? I didn't do anything. And I told this to all of my friends. They're like, what do you mean you haven't done anything? And they would start like listing off. I'm like, yeah, but it's just an article that I wrote. And like, but for POC, I don't know, it's just a database or like, I don't know. It's just like, it's not like that big. Like, it's not like Oprah level. And they're like, are you insane? And I'm like, no, I'm just telling you that it's like not that big of a deal. <laughs> so that was like amplified when I went to the summit, but it was really amazing to be in that room with all of those individuals who are doing really amazing things. And I found it quite inspiring in terms of the next steps that I want to take for future work. Yeah. I mean, how do you even absorb and process all of that? I had to leave the room a few times because I was <laughs> like, oh my, there's, there's so much. Because also Joe Biden had gone on stage as well. And Joe Biden talks a lot. <laughs> and he actually went over his like a lot of time by like an hour. So an Michelle hour? Obama, <laughs> Michelle Obama and Oprah were supposed to speak, and they were everything got pushed because you know he's the VP, so no one was going to tell him to get the hell off the stage. So they just let him go. <laughs> so it just it was supposed to end at like five p.m. and it went until like seven at night. Um, <laughs> but. So that's part of the reason why I left the room because I was like, he's talking too much. I can't do this. I don't even know what he's saying. <laughs> and, and then that's I came so back and I was like, and now I'm in this room and there are these power hat. Like one woman is like taking like children out of slavery. This other woman over here is like creating shoes for young women around the world. I'm like, and I just wrote an article. You know what? I'm I'm just gonna go outside and get myself a drink because I don't even know how to handle this space right now. <laughs> so it was intense. <laughs> Well, we could have a whole episode on imposter syndrome. At the same time, I'm glad that you are recognized and that you're forced to sort of look in the mirror and remind yourself that you were there. You actually did create work that was worthy of being acknowledged in that way. And yeah, mm -hmm. POC need a voice in tech. And you, you took it upon yourself to put yourself out there and talk about yeah. some really uncomfortable things. I think that's yeah. worthy of being acknowledged as a change maker, for sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, as you've sort of shared your life experience with us, there's been a, a few recurring um, stories. One is that you like to do a lot of different things, not just one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two is that you like to start school and then you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and three is that this medical thing kind of keeps sneaking up on you and forcing you to slow down. Yeah. How does this like synthesize into a life lesson that you seem to be revisiting in order to integrate fully? Mm, like, what yeah. do you think the universe is telling you to get woo woo? I, <laughs> I mean, I love talking about the universe. So I feel like <laughs> we're, this is why we're starting a company. So this makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say that the universe is telling me to focus on myself a little bit. I think I've realized that I give a lot to others and I don't give much to myself. And I would say that this medical leave has really kind of brought me to my knees, so to speak, in a way that I, I try to take care of every other person mm. except me. Mm. And like we've talked about earlier, like if I'm constantly giving and I'm at a deficit, then there will be no more of me left. So part of this medical leave has also been teaching me and all of my experiences have been teaching me to figure out what I want. And you know what? It's okay if I don't know what I want. And it's okay to slow down too. 
And it's okay to take time for myself to make sure that I'm okay. Are you okay receiving help? No, <laughs> <laughs> I am not. I am not. So that's one big lesson. I yeah. would say that lesson has been huge for me, especially in the month of March. Um, I have tried opening up more to a lot of my close friends about what's been going on. And people have just been flooding out of the woodworks. And I'm like, oh, this is what it's like to have another human being care about you. Oh, I, I was certain that I was a miser. Okay. <laughs> well, then. Um, so, yeah, it's still a t- getting used to that. It's a tough thing. And I feel like medical challenges are there to show you that your relationships really are two-way streets. And yeah. people really do want to help you. They don't want to just squeeze you dry and take assistance from you. They want to give back to you. So, Amelie, let it in. Let let the people <laughs> love you. They want to. What would you say is the most like urgent and important message you have for the world right now at this moment in time? This is like tying into what I'm going to be sharing in, in the next few days. I would say my most urgent message is that it's okay to struggle and there are no expectations of you to be more than where you are at right now. And that's okay. Like you're enough as you are at this point in time. Wow. I think that's something we could all be reminded of on a daily basis. Yeah, I agree. So when you visualize your future self, Mm -hmm. what are you thinking about? What are you seeing? In my future, I am traveling the world. I am researching design pedagogy, specifically from the lens of hegemonic design. Now you ask, what is hegemonic design? Hegemonic design is design that is viewed from the lens of a very Eurocentric perspective. So when we think about design, we think about Paula Scher or Milton Glaser or Dieter Ranz. I'm interested in exploring design from a different lens. How do people in the Caribbean think of design? How do people in indigenous cultures think of design? How do people in Asia, Latin America, et cetera, think about design? What about the design voices that we have yet to hear? And is the way in which we do design in the West the air quotes right way to do design? I don't think it is. So I want to create a talk show and a magazine, um, essentially photojournalism, just traveling the world, interviewing people, not like uh, going in and kind of doing like, got to save you from your culture, but just taking a step back and letting that individual tell me about what they're perceiving, what they're seeing, and then sharing that with the world. And then taking that research and crafting it into a PhD so that people can get a better understanding of the different ways in which other cultures engage with design, and then finally opening up a design school. Oh my God, this is the best vision Thank you. So the best vision. I'm on board for the talk show part. I I have no interest in the PhD. You're speaking straight to my heart because I've always had this frustration with how, especially how design is presented in popular culture in in Mm -hmm. our media and on our TV shows. I feel like Mm. it's really distorted and it's a distortion of what the design process is and the real design process all over the globe is so fascinating and rich and textural and so much more informative and there's ways to present this that are not exploitative and are not necessarily subject to the gimmicks and trickery of television shows but can still be presented and consumable in a way that gets everybody as excited about it as I am. Exactly. And you're excited too. And I want this to be real. It's gonna I mean you can be one of my first interviews. Okay. Let's make it real. <laughs> Yay. Let's go share the power of design with the world through popular media. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the reasons why that feels so strongly to me is because I remember reading, well, again, just to back up, like being like first generation American. um, I remember when I started learning more about design, like seeing how design is done in Jamaica and my immediate visceral reaction is, oh, that's ugly. And Mm. I was like, oh, wait, wait a second. But why is it ugly? 
I didn't think it was ugly before I went to school. I think it's ugly because someone told me that that's ugly. And who who are they to decide that that's ugly? And what does ugly even mean? Um, so there's that. But then also I remember reading an article about some Ethiopian designers who went to school in design school in Europe. And I don't remember the name of the language for Ethiopia, um, but it's essentially a script that, if I recall correct- correctly, is not read from right from left to right, but right to left. Mm. And they learned how to kern and lead type for Roman letters. So all of this education and knowledge that they learned for romance languages could not apply to their own culture and language. And I was like, that's horrible. That's horrible. Wow. That makes no sense. Clearly a disconnect. And we need to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you've talked a lot about your future self, but I'd like to know if there's anything coming up more currently that you would like our listeners to know about. As I dropped hints that were not so subtle earlier, um, in the next week or so, I'm actually going to be releasing a series, a written series about my health journey and what I'm going through. It's a bit of a memoir, if you will. And I will be turning that into, I guess you can say, a, either a weekly or biweekly series. It's not quite clear, but it's obviously very personal stuff. Um, so you'll be able to find that information on social media. I'll be tweeting about it. My Twitter handle is at Amelie Lamont. And you can also check me out on my website, amelie.is as well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your voice with us and your story. And thanks for listening. We wish you so much well-being. Thank so you. much well-being. You take care of yourself. And sh- and when you're ready to share your story, we'll be following along so we can Thank all you so much. learn to take care of ourselves. Thanks for listening. To see images of Amelie's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And we would love your support. There are so many ways you can support Clever. First, you can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. That really does help. Second, you can sponsor an episode or make a donation, which you can do through our website at cleverpodcast.com. Third, tell your friends, tell your aunts, tell your uncles, tell your next door neighbor, tell your dog walker. (laughs) Yes, anyone you think would love hearing these stories, tell them about Clever. We also love to hear from you directly on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, so you can find us at Clever Podcast. Send us what you think about the episodes. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VBE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.